Hey, rock stars, I'm JB, expert salesperson and master presenter. I'm the doctor, psychologist, and behavioral expert. This is the Entrepreneur Mastery Lab Podcast. Welcome back to the lab. I'm JB. I'm the doctor. If this is your first time joining us, thank you for joining us here in the EML, where we have real talk with real professionals, even if it just happens to be the two of us. If you're a returning listener or viewer catching us on the podcast or YouTube, welcome back. And if you haven't already, go ahead, give us that like, subscribe, follow, so more people can hear our message going forward. And thank you. Push the thumbs up button, five star thingy, turn on those notifications. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. Do them all. You heard him, folks. Get to it. Hey, Doc, speaking of great, clear communication, I love that. And anybody who is joining us again probably caught our last podcast where we were talking about communication. I think that was about as clear as it gets. We communicated well on all the things that communication should involve. I'm processing that to make sure I understand what you meant. But sure, um, we're, we're going to go run with it. Uh, Communication, important soft skill. If you're looking to develop and get better, it's a, it's a good one. If you have interest and you didn't check out our previous podcast, go ahead and do it. Uh, we're bringing it up, though, because we got a great guest joining us today to talk about a topic near and dear to her heart. We have Gina Riley of Gina Riley Consulting. Gina, thanks for joining us here on the lab. I am so excited to have this conversation. Thanks for having me. Well, we are super pumped for you to join us. Can you do our listeners and viewers a quick favor and just share a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Uh, my primary day job is I'm a career coach. I help uh, leaders and executives who are in career transition. I have a model that I call career velocity, and I work people through those various stages step by step in order to prepare their branding, their messaging, their communicating, their interview prep, all the things that have to happen before you target and then go after those jobs. Nice. Do you uh, do you feel like at this point people are ever not in transition? I feel like the average like time time of employment is like less than three years. So when are you not in transition nowadays? You know that's a really astute question because I do believe that we should kind of be ready at any time because we uh, we can fall victim to things like layoffs as we we've seen out on our landscape. And so it goes back to uh, my early career was at Intel. I spent 10 years there in corporate. And there's a saying inside there is you own your own career. And that really seeped into my being because there were times that I thought I was going to get tapped on the shoulder to take that next level job. And I didn't. And it was painful. And it, I had to come to my own realization that I own my path. And I own the building blocks that will get me to that next thing that I want. I, I love that. And it, it's it's so timely because we are seeing and hearing all about these these layoffs in California in particular is being hit hard. There was just a, an article in the Financial Planning Journal about mm -hmm. how impacted California has been with with layoffs. Uh, and so I, I guess to your point, we kind of always need to be prepared for this because we don't know what the future is going to hold. And I've always said you know, for, for me personally, I don't have a lot of trust or faith in the corporate world, having having worked for a Fortune 50 company for many, <laughs> many years. Uh, it's looked at as a place of security, oftentimes, especially compared to entrepreneurship. And yeah. it, to, to me, it's just a different risk profile, right? It's not it's not that one's more secure than the other. It, we just have different risks in each of those uh, models. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. And I think, um, you know, we've we have multi-generations in the workforce. And so if we look at boomers, Gen X is my generation. We were taught, you go work hard, you put your head down, you go get your job. And you know, boomers may have had the mindset of like, I'm gonna be there for a long, long time. Things have changed. Um, Gen X, I think that we, we've had to cope with that. The generations coming behind us are used to it. You know, They know that the jobs aren't necessarily for life and there's not a pension you know, <laughs> at the end of it all. So we have to look at our whole career as this evolution and a journey and that there's building blocks that we're putting into place that will help us get that next you know, opportunity. We had a we had a guest not too long ago, a couple months ago now on the on the podcast, uh, Dr. David Troy, a, a psychologist that does uh, assessments for executive hiring. Yeah. Uh, so 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 probably you know uh, some synergy with what you do, and he he made a really interesting comment that stuck out to me, which is just that hiring is not supposed to be for permanence. 
you know, in, in, in today's world, right? We hire for a specific job in a specific time and a company will change, a culture will change and a person will change. And so we need to kind of get over that whole, I need to find the perfect person forever mentality, right? This is not a soulmate situation. Right. It's, it is for now. And, you know, if we go through the trouble of, let's say an executive search and a company has invested a lot in an executive search firm to go to market, of course, we want that leader to stick for a while, but the point that you're making is right, right on. Um, you know, we may need a leader who um, needs to take a company to the next level or transform it or just keep the wheels on the bus. So what stage and age is the company? And then what is the secret sauce of the candidates that you're looking at and, and identifying the right mix of skills and competencies and past experiences that will now inform what that person's going to do for you? today and and can they will that will that work for the next two four or five years what brought you into it i i mean you, you talked about having a 10-year career at intel previously what made you want to kind of become the the career coach and work on transitions for executives there's got to be a driver that kind of brought that on a hundred percent um the driver started when i was about 16 where I think a lot of people can identify with uh, being a teenager and, and maybe having misfires with communication, not being understood, not developing relationships in ways that are really productive. And so I got in the line of fire with um, motivational speakers and, and uh, started training to be like a better communicator through these different programs. Um, I developed some of these programs in college. Um, I got a degree in communication, and I believe fundamentally that if we learn to ask better questions and we learn to communicate better, our professional lives will be better and our personal lives will be better. So the driver, that's what underpins what I'm doing is I'm helping professionals communicate better. And that's one of your keys to executive presence, which is really what we wanted to, to chat about on the on the conversation today. That's kind of I don't want to jump ahead, but that's kind of the second part of, of some of what you, you speak to. So can you can you walk us through executive presence and why it's such an important topic for anybody in the transition Absolutely. phase? Yes. Um, what I'll lead with is uh, I rely on um, research that I've done, um, particularly Sylvia Ann Hewlett wrote a book called Executive Presence, The Difference Between Merit and Success, which is such an interesting phrase. A lot of times we expect to be tapped on the shoulder to get that next promotion. And, and what I have learned is that with executive presence, it's something that other people perceive about us. And so being aware of the three dimensions of exec executive presence and the 18 to 20 different micro components is critical for self-awareness and important for our career transition success. Do you want to go deeper into the different dimensions? I, I, I'm just so excited that you're using language that we talk about all the time. When we talk about self-awareness, we, we talk about how much it's not internal it's it's as much about people's perception of us and how we're we're coming off to other people and, and we we personally feel like or i shouldn't speak for for doc but i personally feel like that's a big miss for a lot of people they just have no clue how, how they're coming off that and if you true. want to hear a little bit about that go back a few episodes and we had a whole episode about self-awareness or awareness in general she plug she plug <laughs> So we, um, we, didn't, we didn't plan the timing of these podcast releases, by the way, but we, we literally just a, a quick hits on self-awareness and communication before we brought you on here. So it, it's, it's great timing. You keep going. You keep you talking. Just tee, you just tee me right up. Well, the thing about self-perception that I think is important, and I talk about this in my in my coaching program, especially when people are um, targeting jobs where they may be career switching and the perception will be they can't do it. Oh, you don't come from this industry or you haven't had this specific expertise. And what I tell my clients is it's not whether or not you can do the job like, oh, I know I can do this job. The question is, do they perceive you have a skill gap, a competency gap? And so one of those potential gaps in perception does relate to executive presence, which is how we're actually showing up how we're showing up on Zoom, how we're showing up on our live streams, how we're showing up in the room, all of it counts. So when you say showing up, are you speaking to like appearance and impressions? Can, can you kind of dig into that a little bit more? 
Absolutely. So according to the social science and the executive presence research, there's three universal dimensions that translate around the world um, that, it, that are a part of executive presence. And that is our appearance, our communication, and our gravitas. That's how we look, how we speak, and how we act. And, and the first hurdle in people's perception about us is appearance, even though it's the least important of the three dimensions. Here's why. Humans, we like to sort out information and make a judgment. We, we're trying to like figure out people's place in the world and our place in the world. 250 milliseconds is all it takes for us to make a first impression and, and have some kind of imprint and judgment that we're already making about it. So we show up here, you're, you're giving, you know, you're checking me out. You're like, okay, well, what is she wearing? And does she look like she's ready to go? And all the things like, how old is she? Um, what is her hair like? And we're doing the same, like with each other all the time. So if we're not ready on that first go with those two seconds, 250 milliseconds, um, you've already missed an opportunity to make a good impression. I feel like Gina's just now quoting all our old podcasts. <laughs> you're you're going to do the same, the same call out I was going to do. Gina, you, you, you might shock you. We did a pod, one of ver our very first podcasts, actually. Maybe our second podcast or something was uh, just how to effectively network. And we talked about how the, the actual effectiveness of a good networking experience starts before you actually network in the preparation and getting yourself prepared to show up. And, and we talked, I, I think we even talked about less than half a second to, to make a first impression and how important that is. We actually did a whole podcast on first impressions too. Back then. <laughs> so, I'm starting to think she's done a research. I don't know. <laughs> well, let's break down what appearance, there's five different aspects under appearance and um, I'll go through the order in, in, in its importance. The first is being polished and groomed. The science says that 35% of the people that responded to the surveys say being polished and groomed is the most important. The second most is being physically attractive. And the important thing about the physical attractiveness isn't, are you really beautiful or really handsome? It's, do you take care of yourself? That's part of it. Um, wearing simple and stylish clothes. Another one that can be teeth grinding, especially for men, is being tall. That's only 6%, though, or 12%, something like that. And then being youthful and vigorous, meaning you show up like you're bright eyed and ready to go no matter what your age. So those are the things. Um, and there's things that we cannot control. We can't control our height. We can't control if we're, you know, getting older, but we can control if we're polished and groomed. And that's the most important part of appearance. Don't worry, Doc. I think you're beautiful. I mean, I'm not getting older. And according to my Tinder profile, I'm six, seven. <laughs> <laughs> Neither so, one of those things are accurate, though. <laughs> you you uh you threw percentages out there, Gina. So so what what was height? Height is only six percent overall, but it's twelve percent importance for men, and that's just for appearance. Once we get over that hurdle, though, once we're like past, like okay, I've scanned you, I'm ready to listen. Now we move into how are you communicating, and what is your gravitas, how we speak, and how we act. Which which are the bigger impactors of of executive presence? Yeah. Um, and and circle back for me. Maybe, maybe you said this, and I just missed it. I want to I want to make sure we're clear on this. What, mm -hmm. Why such an emphasis on executive presence? Why why does it mm -hmm. matter so much? Oh, that's a good question. So, in in my experience, there is a specific miss that executives make when I have conducted executive searches. So uh, in the past couple of years, a lot of what we're doing is on Zoom. So, you know, there are leaders who will get on and not pay attention to their environment. They'll have a ceiling fan spinning literally behind their head or they're not dressed maybe in a way that looks like they should be considered as a CEO, whatever that may be, there's that first hurdle. But worse than that, is not reading the room, whether that's the virtual room or the actual room. And I'm talking about EQ and, and reading the signs of like how you're going to have that conversation back and forth. Do you, do you have examples of that? Oh, I do. <laughs> oh, I'm, now I'm excited. <laughs> so it's not juicy. 
Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. So um, <laughs> when I have con conducted executive search, what I have learned to do is if I have an hour to spend with someone, I will ask them that question that most of us recruiters will ask, hey, tell me a little bit about yourself. But what I've learned if, is if I give that much leash, no matter who's on the other side of that question, they don't know where to take it. They don't know how long. So I, I throw them a bone. Um, it's, you know, otherwise I think it's kind of unkind. So I'll say, I need you in five minutes or less to give me a quick career highlights. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Then I've got eight questions that are based on competencies that I'm going to market for. And I really want to get there. So here's not reading the room. I've just told you I have an hour. I'm giving you five minutes to tell me about yourself. And then I want to go deep. I have had people do the tell me about yourself for 20 minutes out of a 60 minute interview. That is not executive level material. I can't put that kind of person who can't read the room when I was that clear in front of my client. It's very unlikely that person's going to move forward. I could, I could read where that story was coming from a mile away. <laughs> so that is actually part of gravitas, which is how we act. And it's part of emotional intelligence, which is rated at 61% importance. It's, in, it's very important. The number one thing for, um, for gravitas is actually grace under fire. Do you have confidence? You know, can you, can you, um, can you navigate the room with confidence? And then can you make decisions in the wake of other people not being able to make them? And that's called showing teeth, according to Hewlett's uh, works. Like, yeah, like I can make a decision. And how amazing is that too? Like when we look at men and women, there are some differences about how, uh, hurdles that women have to overcome that men don't. Like if we show up with too much teeth, then we get called the B word, right? So we have to, there's this balancing act. Bold. You get called yeah. bold. That right? one. That's, that that's one. the word. Exactly. So I have had to work with my female clients on showing up with confidence. And um, one example is uh, sometimes people, when they're asked about a certain leadership uh, accomplishment, they'll say, well, we did this, we did that, we did this. And and when I'm working with them, like, first, you have to explain what you did as a leader. I set the stage. I I got the strategy in front of my team. I we, we collaborated, and then I assigned these things, and then we executed. So vacillating between I and we shows humility, but it shows confidence that you took charge. Yeah, the uh, the the conductor in a lot of ways, or the yes. the, ma the maestro, you know, absolutely co coordinating all the moving pieces and and moving forward as as needed. Uh, okay, let me let me take an attempt at see if I can make that into an actionable thing. We, JB and the doctor, have an amazing podcast because I am on it. <laughs> Is that close? Is that what we're going for? That was so I humble. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> I, 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 lo I love that we've gotten three sentences out of him and that was two. <laughs> See, it, it just thank you for proving my point. <laughs> just wanted to make sure we're on the same page, you know, we're going in the same direction. But one thing that, you know, to circle back to, though, is a part of communication is being able to read the room, whether it's virtual or otherwise. You have to have that EQ, that presence, that ability to, like, pay attention to people's expressions. You know, how, how are people responding to you? That's a part of communication. As, as somebody who's working with, with executives and you, you clearly work as a recruiter as well. So you kind of work both sides of the fence. I have. Uh, it feels to me like this stuff is much harder virtually than it is in person. Uh, is, is that the case in your experience or is it, or, or is it am I wrong? Um, I think it varies from person to person. Uh, uh, I believe that we've all gotten much more comfortable doing this. I mean, we've had to. So at this point, if someone's uh, applying for a very senior level role and they cannot do this, they would probably need some coaching or training. And if it's not career coaching, it might be like 
working with a presenter, like a speech, you know, someone that helps people with speeches and whatnot. Um, before the pandemic, it was all over the map. I mean, I had very nervous executives getting on for their first time. I mean, we were using Skype. I mean, the, the company that I uh, work with, Talents Group, we've been using these technologies long before the pandemic because we do nationwide and sometimes global search. So we can't be flying off to New York when we're in Portland when we need to do a mass like, you know, we have to get through a lot of interviews to pull it down. So we're not flying around doing that. Make, make, makes a lot of sense. Go, going back to the the components of executive presence, we've, we've got, we've got appearance that's kind of first, but mm -hmm. least important, although it's kind of the, it's, it's, it's interesting. It, it has the least importance you said, but it's hard to kind of ignore it, which I guess is why you talk about it because it's, it, you stumble there, you're in real trouble. Completely. Absolutely. Think, at this point, Gina, you need to reinforce uh, JB that appearance is very important because that is his, uh, it's the only it's the only thing he keeps me around for. It, it's really a struggle on a podcast because nobody knows. <laughs> That's why I went on YouTube. Nobody knows what the yeah. <laughs> you know it. I have uh, changed over the course of the pandemic, but um, many days, especially in the early months of the pandemic, I was still wearing, you know, my business shoes. Even if I wasn't completely dressed head to toe, I would when it was an important call, I would put on my. Uh, here I have an example. I'll show you. Like I'll have my shoes ready to go. For our for all our podcast listeners, they're beautiful. They, beautiful they blue suede shoes. Blue suede shoes. I know. And guess what? I walk taller. I stand taller. Um, we. I, I think we all do. There's pride in putting ourselves together in that way. Thank you very much. Nice call out. I like that. that. Was good. Blue suede shoes. So we, we have we have appearance, and then we have communication. We have gravitas uh you could talk about them in a vacuum but i i mean to, to, literally to the point you were just making appearance lends itself to gravitas you know communication is, is a part of having gravitas uh the, none yeah. of these are in a vacuum no they're not they, i mean they work together and i think the what's important and i've done facilitated sessions talking about executive presence and having people discuss and dissect um, their own kind of like rating themselves on these various 18 to 20 things um, and then talking with other people to get those perceptions like how do you think I show up that helps us like figure out well what are the things that I might need to work on if you're trying to work your way up the ladder and you've got perceptions about you that don't match what you believe inside for yourself, you've got to go recon reconcile that or else you're going to have a really difficult time. And the best thing that you can do is to get mentors, you know, people who can coach you. And I'm not talking about career coaching. I am talking about if you're in corporate listening to this or even if you're a business owner, it's important to have mentors to help give you honest, real feedback or else you're not going to grow. I, I mean, I feel like there was a script from our previous podcast that you're just following it. I, I don't even you know. No, this is not scripted. Come on now. I, I know, but we, we were talking about a feedback loop with awareness. So, so we had this conversation and I, I'm curious about your opinion. So it's not, it's not <laughs> directly about executive presence, but uh, we, we were talking about our opinions on where gaining awareness starts kind of like the very first step to, to gaining an awareness and and Ooh. my my perspective and then i'll let i'll let the the doc share his mine was it's a feedback loop like how can you have awareness if you're not aware of your blind spots like you need to know where the perception's different than what you think it is Absolutely. Um, so for for me it was just that feedback loop which you were just describing doc doc what was yours <laughs> Mine was more about the implementation of just starting to be aware of your surroundings and, and the people that you're talking to. Um, so obviously the feedback loop would be very important if you have zero awareness, but if you have some, it's just to start to gain paying attention to those surroundings around you, mm -hmm. especially others. What's your stance on it, Gina? Um, I'm, I don't know if I have a lot to add. I'm in alignment with what you both said. And I, and I do think that uh, it, it, the best thing that one can do to build self-awareness is to to have people who can give you honest feedback 
in your life. And I, I call that like the personal board of directors, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it, what's really informative to someone's career is to have different seats on that bus. So if you're um, a marketing professional, for example, um, why not consider having someone with some kind of finance, finance background or operations leadership or HR background or who fill in the blank? Have other people who sit on that team that you contract with and say, hey, can I tap into you once a month or once a quarter and come and ask you questions that will help me develop my career and help me develop personally? I absolutely love it. I'm also going to count it as a, as a point for JB because I feel like you agreed with me just a little bit more than you did with the doc. And so I'm, I'm counting it. That, that, that's, that's plus <laughs> one for me, buddy. Oh, you need it, buddy. I appreciate that. You were, you were top notch. Okay, well, you don't need to patronize. That was, it was reinforcing your, your awesomeness. I mean, there's no doubt. If you wanted me to change my behavior, you wouldn't be reinforcing it. I'm just going to point that out for everybody. A little psychology talk. I'm also calling talk. back to uh, one of our last podcasts where we, we talked about uh, supporting you to be reinforcing. <laughs> All right. I, I'm, I'm curious. You, you talked about how executive presence is global. And, and kind of just in general mm. that, you know, there's, there's certain aspects here that it, it doesn't matter where you are. It, it matters, but you also talked about the difference between uh, male and female here with, with the ex yeah. executive presence. Uh, so is that global as well? I mean, is it the same challenges throughout with male, female, it, it, can yeah. you just to go into that a little bit for us? What I would say is even though the surveys that were done and what I'm leaning on with this research, uh, you know, was done globally, I am 100 percent confident that there are cultural differences. So, you know, if you take this research and you and you look at, gosh, you know, I need to show teeth or be assertive in this other environment somewhere else in the world, it may not serve you. So I think that cultural awareness would be really, really important. Um, when it comes to, you know, male, female, I, I, I think that, you know, without going to the far corners of the world, I think it, it could be agreed upon that women have different challenges in how we're perceived. Um, we have to pay attention differently to how we're showing up. Um, and then all the more wise to have people that can give us feedback about how we appear and how we show up. And I'm not talking about just physical appearance, Although, you know, there are times in, I think, all of, all of our careers where we may, we, we may need notes on the appearance too. Um, from what I have observed is like, as maybe women get older, one thing that counts against them, and this, the research backs it up, is they're dressing, dressing too young. Like it's not too hip, it's just dressing sort of not as appropriate for one's age. So the, these are all the things that women are really they think about this. Like before we get on Zoom, y'all can put on a t-shirt and jump on and look great. We're thinking, gosh, does my makeup look? We have to like go make up a whole, you know, hour before and, you know, make sure the color scheme is going to look great. And we're just thinking about these things and it takes time, effort, money, takes time away from work. I mean, these are the things that we have to do in order to have a certain perception about us. So I don't have any data to cite here, but I'm, I'm really very confident that the numbers of women in the executive roles is still pretty, pretty much a minority compared to men in executive roles. But are you seeing a shift in kind of how women are, are showing up, I guess, or, or, or their presence? Are you seeing that start to balance a little bit more, I guess, is what I'm asking? Cause we've had conversations with other professionals and we've kind of, we, we, we tend to recognize that you know, male and female is, is much more of a spectrum today than it used to be. It's not nearly as black at black and white. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it feels like there's kind of, um, I guess a little bit more acceptance mm -hmm. going on there today than in the past, but are you seeing mm -hmm. that or not really? Um, so my experience today is more anecdotal based on the different leaders I work with. Right. I had the 10 years in corporate and Certainly, I mean, being at a place like Intel, like if you're with any big company like that, technology or otherwise, like a Nike, right? There is a culture that it, that it seeps into your bones. If you're if you're to be successful, 
you embrace and embody that. I mean, I still have blue in my veins. Like I, there's certain things that I do because of the way I was formed and certain ways that I behave that are part personality driven and then part shaped by the corporate environment that I chose to be in. So there's people potentially who are, let's say boomer, Gen X and making a broad generalization who, um, we may have had messages that we had to act and walk and talk a certain way. I think that that is definitely relaxing. And you you look on LinkedIn and you look at the way that senior women leaders are now expressing themselves. And there's, a, there's more um, heart and emotion and the discussion of like the people skills combined with the other leadership skills. The balance is shifting. Um, how we come to accept it takes time. So to add from my uh, psychological side point, um, I feel that this, the idea of gender needs to be looked at a lot and just the idea of there's still these roadblocks put in place, right? So we still have to be aware of the, the glass ceilings that are there. We still have to be aware of um, the definite advantages a white cis male is gonna have in the workplace, whether mm -hmm. they are aware of it or not, there's still always gonna be that it's going to be there. Um, but when it comes to people that are coming up in business, and I, I think that's what we're speaking to a lot of is some of these people that are already there, but some that are still working to get towards there. Mm -hmm. The idea that they want to don't worry as much about trying to fit into a certain model of what the statistics say a gender is supposed to be right. Fit into a certain model of how you feel more comfortable. Uh, and I think the older generations are getting caught up in that where they're still stuck in this old school mentality of, oh, the younger people don't know anything because their hair is a different shape or they're dressed a certain way. Right. And they're losing out on a lot of really quality people that are just expressing themselves different. And then there's some of the younger generation that loses out on some of that wise, you know, um, expertise that could be there that they can learn from because they look at them as, oh, that's just these old stuffy people that don't really know anything. And if we can just pull apart the idea of how appearance could play and think of more of what we want to be and how we want to be authentic to ourselves and then look to those people as our guide, those, as you're saying, finding a mentor. Mm -hmm. So you don't easily find a mentor that, that aligns with your, your gender or your, your beliefs is which one just matches to how you think and how you feel so that you can be more authentic as you're going and it's going to fit your personality better. Right. So you're not trying to force yourself to be something else because, Oh, that person's doing that. And that's how I'm supposed to be as a, a woman coming up or as a man coming up, I'm supposed to fit this mold. Be yourself, find the people that you look to no matter where they're at. And that's a better way of trying to improve those skills. It's just my little side that I was thinking as you were saying that, because so I think you were right on, just think this is where some of the younger business professionals, not younger in age, but just younger in their career mm -hmm. get caught up a lot. I got, I got, I have to say, uh, I think you said a lot of really good things there. I got stuck when you talked about the shape of a woman's hair or shape of someone's hair. And for, for some reason, I just, it brought me back to the eighties with like the giant volume. hair. <laughs> I mean, I, if you're I, a flock of seagulls fan, own it. It's like a Jane Fonda workout video in my head all of a sudden. Don't do it. It's not good for the ozone. Let him not go. No, no. So, but, but, but really good stuff there, Doc, that I, that I appreciate. Uh, Gina, I'm, I'm going to bring this back to something that I think we, we challenge, we find ourselves challenged with uh, when we're trying to work with people where it's easy for us to kind of sit back and I'm sure for you too, you, you you bring somebody in for an interview and you're like, oh my gosh, like the emotional intelligence is not there or the executive <laughs> presence is just not there. But to recognize it as an outsider and then for somebody to recognize it within themselves is very, very different. How do you how do you broach that with people or do you broach it with them? Or is that something that they come to on their own? Yeah. So with a recruiter hat on, that's not something as a recruiter that you you necessarily owe a candidate. A candidate has kind of uh, fallen by the wayside through the process. Um, you know, giving that kind of feedback isn't necessarily what you're there to do. You're there to serve the client company to vet the right leader. So if I take that hat off and put my coaching hat on, um, there's things that I can do to help 
my clients if I notice that there's these stumbling blocks. One example is with communication. Number one thing under communication is superior speaking skills. Well, a leader may be very confident in their work environment and ha have given presentations to hundreds of people. It's very different when I ask, tell me about yourself, and then it turns into this robotic, you know, dissertation. So there's, I'm, I'm helping people, you know, by saying, hey, that's not going to fly. You're going to put your, your interviewer to sleep. Let's shape this differently. Let's say less. Let's say the most important things and let's do it with a little zeal versus sounding like you're reading like a robot from a script. You know, so there's these things that I'm doing or if, if um, I have a few people, they're, they're, the pitch of their voice is very high. So I'll, I'll call out like you may want to start practicing bringing your register down a bit because there is science behind that too, that it's harder to listen to the timber of someone's voice when it's really, you know, when the pitch is really high. So there's these things that people can do to build awareness and then make some self-correction. What if, what if they're not a client yet? So let, so is, are, is there anything that somebody could look out for to suggest to themselves, Hey, I might have something here that I need to work on. Are there signs or red flags that people might be able to self-identify with? Oh yeah. Well, the first thing is, um, and this is what I'll hear when someone calls and says, I'm frustrated. I haven't had these opportunities internally or externally. The most painful sometimes is not getting the promotion or maybe a lateral move that would have been really advantageous. And then they're like, yeah, there's something that's missing. You know, I'm being told something's holding me back. Well, the something that's holding you back, the riches of that conversation is right there in your company that they already know you. All these people have some perception about you. So again, it goes back to the mentors. You've got to ask. You have to ask the hard questions and you have to call out the elephant in the room. And if you're not the one to call out the elephant in the room, maybe no one's going to do it for you. Absolutely love that. And, and I think there could be a whole conversation around just how do you ask and find a mentor? Uh, and how do you go through that? Because uh, I could just recall back to my previous experience in, in the corporate world. It wasn't always easy. Uh, even trying to help formalize a process. And I think I tried mm -hmm. to put together a, a mentorship program and, and I did, you know, how successful it ended up being is a whole nother story, uh, but a formalized men mentor process to get better feedback. And it's, it's, it's a challenge to get people to buy into that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that could be a whole nother conversation. It can We're be done. It can be done. Um, and th there's great work out there I'll offer to you. And if you want an introduction, I interviewed Lisa Fain, F-A-I-N. Um, she's the CEO for the Center of Mentoring Excellence out of Washington State, out of Seattle, I believe. And Lisa's written, co-authored a couple of books. And it's all about like, how do you contract with people? How do you ask for the relationship? As a leader, what what is your responsibility in that? As the per the participant, the mentee, there, there's a lot of good stuff out there and there's a lot of good reasons why you do all of that and you contract so that it's a solid growing relationship between two individuals um, and it has an ending point. So, you know, there's good stuff out there. If she's anything like you would absolutely love the introduction. <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> I'll send you some info. I'll send you the article that I wrote. I interviewed her and uh, I'd love to make an intro. She's great. Thank you. Speaking of great, we heard that you might have something great for our audience that you'd like to share and how they can also contact you. Sure. Um, so on my consulting website, Gina Riley Consulting, people can go to the top. There's a green button. You click on it. You get a free 30 minute webinar. Check your spam folder. There's a workbook that you get and you can print it out and you can start to make your own career transition plan if you're kind of wondering what those moving parts are and you don't even have to hire a coach. It's totally free. Um, and then other than that, I'm on LinkedIn um, all the time. So if you want to send me a personalized connection request, let let me know that you heard me here on the podcast because I do vet. We get a lot of sales pitches. So I look at every single person's profile before I I say yes, um, but I love to grow my network with uh, solid professionals. So those are two things. And then I publish regularly on Industry Expert Magazine. Um, I've written about 40 articles for that publication, all on careers. Nice. Of course, all that will be in the show notes. And I, and I can vouch personally for Gina's excellence on LinkedIn. She has some of the best uh, follow-up right. skills that I've run across on LinkedIn. <laughs> really, really impressed, which, which, which by the way, that's no small feat. 
I had to like tra trap you in the Krispy Kreme like <laughs> parking lot. <laughs> Met metaphysically, she didn't actually trap me. I promise. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I'm all the way over here in Portland, Oregon. So that, yeah, that's we're a long way away. Is actually <laughs> we're about as far as you get. It's still be in the in the country together. No, Gina, uh, really enjoyed the conversation today. Thank you so much for joining us here in the lab. It, real pleasure to have you. Thank you. I hope we added value for your for your audience. I, I'm so glad you have me. Thanks for having us. Having you. All of us being together. Yes. All and even that. if even if the audience didn't gain value, which which would be shocking, but I gained value. So so <laughs> my boxes got checked. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say check it out. And if you get a chance to see the blue suede, suede shoes, I'm telling you, these are amazing. <laughs> That's no small feet. There is small feet. <laughs> All right. We got to we gotta end it on that one. We're, we're done. It's over. <laughs> uh, all right. Doc, I could not have scripted that conversation better. So we don't have to do like a clip episode next year at the end of the year. Like we always have our like clips from our podcast. We can just use this one. It would be like clips from our other podcast. I I feel like if we had her back again uh, on the show, you know, when we look at decision making and active listening and, le and leadership and, and teamwork and team building, so on and so forth, some of the other soft skills we talk about, those 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 words would just come out naturally in, in the conversation. And we could we could knock out like all, all dozen of our soft skills, like just chatting with with Gina. This is pretty cool. Maybe just have her on and then I can just take a break and, you know, hang out and have a cocktail and watch. Yeah, well, you know, you're welcome to speak up. No, I'm excited about the the idea to sit back and have a cocktail and watch. It's uh, that's on brand. Incommunicado. Little, callback. Little, uh, callback. That's right. That's right. All right, folks, if you're still with us, thank you so much for listening or watching us on YouTube. If you haven't yet, give us that like, subscribe, follow. Check out Gina's details in the show notes. Connect with her if you are or somebody you know is in that stage where you're looking to transition or, you know, you're just in the corporate world and transitioning jobs every few years. Anyways, definitely connect. Check out her workbook. She is fantastic. And if you'd like to follow us anywhere, you can find us on all social media at JB and the Doctor, or you can come over to our website, send us some messages. And of course, you can also slide into our DMs at JB and the Doctor.com or slide into our DMs anywhere. We're all over the place. Slide into his DMs. Leave my leave mine be. Slide away. Keep me entertained though. Like not, nothing like stupid. You know, if you're gonna slide in my DMs, entertain me, please. Somebody's going challenge accepted right now. So, somebody out there is. With some good communication. <laughs> That's key. All right, Doc. I think that uh, that calls it for me, buddy. I'll see you next time, all right? Peace out, you. Later, everybody.